How to Win Friends and Influence People Dale Carnegie Summary of Content Subtitles by Free Book Summary The book is divided into four parts 1. Basic Methods of Dealing with People 2. Six Ways to Make People Like You 3. How to Bend People to Your Point of View 4. Being a Leader How to Change People Without Causing Offense or Resentment Part 1. Basic Methods of Dealing with People Chapter 1. If you want to harvest honey, don't knock over the hive. 99 times out of 100, right or wrong. People do not judge themselves for their actions. Criticism is useless. It makes a person defensive by stimulating attempts to justify themselves. Criticism is dangerous because it strikes at a person's pride, hurts their self-esteem, and causes them to feel resentful. Criticism is like carrier pigeons, they always come home. An animal rewarded for good behavior learns faster and uses what it has learned more effectively and an animal receiving punishment for bad behavior. It's the same with humans. Any fool can criticize, condemn, and express displeasure. It takes strong character and self-mastery to show understanding and leniency. The greatness of a man is shown in the way he treats the little people. Carlyle. Do not criticize, refrain from condemning. Chapter 2. The Great Secret of the Art of Dealing with Men. There is only one way in the moonlit world to get anybody to do anything, and that is to arouse the person to do it. The only way to induce you to do anything is to give you what you want. And what do we want? Sigmund Freud argued that two motives underlie all our actions sexual attraction and the desire to become great. The American philosopher expressed it a little differently, the desire to be significant, the desire to realize the feeling of one's own importance, chosenness, this is one of the main characteristics that distinguish humans from animals. History is replete with amusing examples of famous people struggling to realize this need. Even J. Washington wanted to be called your lordship the President Columbus petition for the title Admiral of the Ocean and Viceroy of India. Catherine the Great did not open letters that were addressed other than to her imperial majesty. So why do these people go mad? There is no definite answer. But many people are imbued with a state of madness in the realization of their own importance. Nothing hurts a person's ambition as much as criticism from management. So it is necessary to believe in the efficacy of encouragement, praise people and avoid scolding. How can we tell the difference between praise and flattery? The former is sincere, the latter is hypocritical. Unless we are immersed in thinking about a particular problem, we usually spend about 95% of our time thinking about ourselves. It is worthwhile to stop this activity for a while and think about the good features of the interlocutor, and we do not have to resort to cheap and false flattery, which can be recognized before it flies off the lips. The most forgotten virtues of our days are gratitude and appreciation. This doesn't just apply to work relationships. In interpersonal interactions, we must never forget that we are around people who are hungry for recognition. Once you offend a person, you will never change them again much less ever inspire them. Emerson said every person I meet is superior to me in some way, and I have something to learn from him. This statement is true for all of us. Then let's stop reflecting on our own accomplishments and desires and try to appreciate the positive aspects of others. Forget flattery. Give only honest and truthful evaluations. Give honest and truthful evaluations. Chapter 3. He who can do this will conquer the whole world. He who cannot is doomed to walk the path alone. Why do we talk about our desires? It's childish. Absurd. Of course, we want what we want very much. But nobody else is interested in it. All people are like that we are only interested in what we want. Therefore, there is only one way to influence other people. By talking about what they want and showing them how to get what they want. The world is full of greedy and self-serving people. Therefore, the rare person who tries to serve others unselfishly has a huge advantage over them. They have few competitors. Owen D. Young, one of the leaders of American business, once said a man who can put himself in the shoes of others and understand their thinking need not worry about what the future holds for him. Looking at a situation from another person's point of view and arousing in them a passionate desire for something does not mean manipulating that person, forcing them to act in a way that harms them. There is a win-win for both parties. William Winter once remarked that self-expression is the dominant need of human nature. Why not take this into account in business relationships? When a brilliant idea comes up, why not let the person you are talking to think of it without insisting on his or her own authorship, considering it as his own? 
will take it with great interest and more quickly decide to implement it. Remember first make your interlocutor passionately desire something. The one who can do it will conquer the whole world. The one who cannot is doomed to a path of loneliness. Make your interlocutor wish for something passionately. Summary of Part 1. Do not criticize, refrain from judging, give honest and truthful evaluations. Make your interlocutor passionate about something. Part 2. Six ways to get people to like you. Chapter 4. Do this and you will be welcome everywhere. By showing interest in other people, you can win more friends in two months and you would have made in two years trying to interest them in your person. Yet most people make the grave mistake of trying to get others interested in them throughout their lives. The other person is not interested in you. He is always interested only in himself. The Viennese psychologist Alfred Adler wrote in his book, What Life Should Mean. To you the individual who is not interested in his fellows, experiences the greatest difficulties in his life and causes the greatest offense to those around him. And it is such people who make losers. If we want to win friends, we should make every effort to do something for others that requires time energy and care. If we want to make friends, we should greet people cheerfully and enthusiastically. Show genuine interest in other people. Chapter 5. A simple way to make a good first impression. Deeds are more meaningful than any words, and a smile says, I like you. You make me happy. I'm glad to see you. Professor James W. McConnell, a psychologist at the University of Michigan, expressed his attitude toward smiling this way a smiling man leads, trains, and sells more effectively. He raises happier children. A smile is far more informative than a frown. This is why approval is a more effective learning mechanism than punishment. You have to experience the joy of interacting with people yourself if you want your partners to have the same feelings when they meet you. You don't feel like smiling at all. What to do in this case, to things. First, force yourself to smile. Act as if you already feel happy, and it will definitely put you back in a good mood. This is what philosopher and psychologist William James suggests that tin seems to be a consequence of mood in fact. They are inseparable. By controlling one's actions, which are directly regulated by the will, one can indirectly influence mood, which is not subject to direct volitional control. Thus, in order to consciously regain lost spirits, one must cheer up and act and speak as if the good mood had never left you. Every man is searching for his happiness, and there is only one sure way to find it to control your thoughts. The feeling of happiness does not depend on external conditions. It is conditioned by your inner state. It doesn't matter what you have, who you are, or where you are. Your feeling of happiness or unhappiness is determined by what you think about it all. As the great Shakespeare said, nothing is either good or bad, our reflections make it so. Essayist and publisher Albert Hubbard wrote, Whenever you leave home, pull yourself up. Hold your head high, fill your lungs with air to the brim, and absorb the sunlight with your whole being. Greet your friends with a smile and put your soul into every handshake. Don't be afraid of being misunderstood, and don't waste a minute thinking about your enemies. Try to firmly define what you want to do, and then, without deviation, move straight to the goal. Fix on the great and wonderful things ahead of you, and as the days slip away, you will find yourself unconsciously grasping for all the opportunities that will ensure the fulfillment of your desires. Just as a coral polyp absorbs from the tidal wave of all the elements it needs, draw in your mind a portrait of a gifted, serious and successful person as you would like to be, and your thoughts early will transform you in the desired direction. Thought is primary. Always maintain the right mental orientation. Be courageous, sincere and optimistic. To think rightly is to create. Everything is realized through desires, and every sincere prayer is answered. We become like the image to which our hearts draw us. Keep your head high and your chin tucked. God is present in each of us in embryo. Your smile is the messenger of your good mood. It brightens the lives of all those around you. To someone who sees a dozen angry, frowning, or just plain detached faces around them, your smile is like a ray of sunshine breaking through the clouds. Smile. Chapter 6. If you don't, you're in trouble. The average person is more interested in his own name than anything else in the world far more than all other names put together. By memorizing and casually using a person's name, you are paying them a subtle and very effective compliment. The habit of memorizing and correctly calling the names of friends, partners, and their subordinates is common to many influential people. Some of them have gone through a lot of work to memorize names. People are so proud of their name that they try to immortalize it at any cost. The rich and rulers pay artists 
writers, and architects to dedicate their works to them, memorizing the names of others and allowing them to feel their own importance. You are the simplest, most obvious, but at the same time effective way to achieve their favor. It takes some effort, but as Emerson said good manners are made up of small sacrifices. It is important to realize that a name is the only sign that belongs entirely to the person we are dealing with. A name sets a person apart and gives them uniqueness. Remember in any language, a person's name is the sweetest and most important sound to him. Chapter 7. An Easy Way to Become a Good Conversationalist At the beginning of the chapter there is a story about how one person called another person an interesting and pleasant interlocutor. While this interlocutor had no knowledge of the topic at all, said a couple of words during the whole conversation, but listened attentively. Thus an opinion was formed of him as a good interlocutor. While in fact, he was only a good listener encouraging himself to speak. The former president of Harvard University, Charles W. Eliot said there is no mysticism in successful business communication. Exceptional attention to the words of the person with whom you are conversing is the most important thing, and there is nothing that caresses the ear more than this. The need for good listeners is experienced not only by celebrities, but also by the most ordinary people. Therefore, in striving to be a good conversationalist, be an attentive listener. To be interesting, be interested, ask questions that the other person will enjoy answering. Encourage him, her to tell you about himself, herself and his, her accomplishments. Remember that for the person you are entering into a conversation with, he himself, his needs and his problems are a hundred times closer than you and your problems. Be a good listener, encourage others to talk about themselves. Chapter 8. How to get people interested. This chapter consists of stories of how people gain favor with others by talking about topics that interest them. When starting any conversation, you can start a conversation on a topic of interest to the person you are talking to, i.e. You can try to arouse their enthusiasm. When you frame a conversation with a person in terms of their personal interests, both parties benefit. Decides the fact that you gain the appreciation of a particular person. This appreciation enriches your life with every minute of the conversation. Talk about what interests your conversation partner. Chapter 9. How to win people's favor immediately. If we are so selfish that we cannot give a little happiness and honestly recognize someone's merits without trying to get something in return, if our souls are no larger than the sour fruit of a wild apple tree, then, we are doomed to failure, which we deserve in full. There is one essential law of behavior. By following it, we can almost always avoid trouble. In fact, this law, if followed, provides us with countless friends and good fortune. But violate it, and we immediately bring upon ourselves endless misfortunes. This law does this always act in such a way that the interlocutor feels his importance. Professor William James Among the essential principles of human nature is the passionate desire to be appreciated. For millennia, philosophers have pondered the norms of human relationships, and from all this reasoning, only one, the most important commandment, should stand out. The quintessence of this, perhaps the most important principle in the world, is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You seek the approval of those with whom you interact, you desire recognition of your true worth. Therefore, let us follow the golden rule and give to others what we would like to receive from them. The truth is that every person perceives himself in some respect higher than any of those around him, and the surest way to his heart can be found by unobtrusively letting him know that you recognize his importance and recognize it sincerely. People who are least satisfied with their achievements support their state of mind by ostentatious vanity and swagger, which make a repulsive impression. Talk to men about themselves, said Disraeli. One of the smartest men who ever ruled the British Empire. Talk to a man about himself, and he will listen to you for hours. Act in a way that makes the other person feel significant, and do it sincerely. Summary of Part 2. Show genuine interest in other people. Smile. Remember that in any language, a person's name is the sweetest and most important sound to them. Be a good listener. Encourage others to talk about themselves. Talk about what interests your interlocutor. Act in a way that makes the other person feel significant. And do it sincerely. Part 3. How to sway people to your point of view. Chapter 10. You can't win in an argument. There is only one way to gain an advantage in an argument. To avoid it. Avoid arguments like you would avoid rattlesnakes and earthquakes. In 9 out of 10 cases, 
Each disputant is even more convinced of their absolute rightness than before. There are no winners in an argument, because when you lose, you lose. But when you gain the upper hand, you lose too. You smash his arguments to pieces, thereby making him feel like a second-class person, hurting his self-esteem. The man will resent your triumph, but a man persuaded against his wishes will remain firm in his opinion. Benjamin Franklin said be arguing, irritating and objecting, you may sometimes win a victory, but it will be empty and meaningless, for in doing so you will never gain the favor of your opponent. An article printed in Beats and Peaches magazine offered some tips to avoid turning disagreements into quarrels welcome disagreement. If two partners agree on everything, one of them is redundant. If you haven't thought about something before, be grateful that this something has been brought to your attention. Suppress your first instinctive reaction when a disagreement arises. To get defensive, stay calm and wait out the first reaction. Control your emotions. A person's level is judged by what can make them angry. Listen first. Give your opponents a chance to speak. Let them finish. After listening, look for points you agree with first. Be honest. See where you can admit you were wrong and say so. Apologize for it. This reduces your opponent's tendency to get defensive. Promise to think about your opponent's ideas. Scrutinize and take note of them. Opponents may be right. The only way to gain an advantage in an argument is to avoid. Chapter 11. The sure way of acquiring enemies and how to avoid that way. Theodore Roosevelt once confessed that to be right 75 out of 100 times would be the top of his expectations. What then to say about us with us? If you are right half the time, why should you point out to others their mistakes? Never directly tell a person they are wrong. That is a challenge. It breeds resistance and a desire to fight you before you have started the conversation. When going to prove something, try not to demonstrate your intentions. If a statement is made that you think is wrong, even if you know quite clearly that it is wrong, isn't it better to start by saying, well, let's see, I thought otherwise, but maybe I'm wrong. Let's check the facts. By recognizing the possibility of error, you will never be in a tight spot. We can admit when we are wrong to ourselves. With a gentle and tactful approach, we can also admit it to others, but not when someone is trying to force this uncomfortable fact down our gullet. Show respect for the other person's opinion. Never say that he is wrong. Chapter 12. If you are wrong, admit it. Anyone looking for an excuse to assert his or her importance and, in a situation where others are engaged in self-accusation, can achieve this in only one way, by adopting a position of generous condescension. Assuming that a confrontation cannot be avoided, is it not better to get ahead of the potential accuser by taking the initiative? Say all the unflattering things about yourself that you suspect your accuser has on his mind, or tongue, and say them before he has a chance to do so. And in a hundred cases against one in this turn of events, he will take a position of generous leniency, and your mistakes will be minimized. Forgiving someone else's mistakes takes some courage, but it also induces a degree of satisfaction. When being right, try to persuade people politely and tactfully, and when being wrong, admit your mistakes quickly and enthusiastically. If you are wrong, admit it quickly and forcefully. Chapter 13. A drop of honey. If a person's heart is tormented by feelings of dislike and ill will toward you, no amount of logic in the world can incline him to your point of view. People are not disposed to change their views. They cannot be forced or coerced to agree with you or me. But it may be possible to induce them to do so by acting gently and friendly. Very gently and very friendly. That's essentially what President Lincoln said, dear, is a most true aphorism which says that a drop of honey attracts more flies than a whole gallon of bile. It is the same with people. Wishing to attract a person to your side, convince him first of your sincere disposition. This is the drop of honey that will captivate his heart. And this, no matter what you say, is the surest way to his mind. Begin with a friendly tone. Chapter 14. Socrates' Secret. When starting a conversation with any person, do not begin by discussing issues on which your opinions differ. From the beginning to the end of the conversation, emphasize those points on which you are unanimous. Whenever possible, emphasize that you are both striving for the same result and that the difference between you is in method, not purpose. Make your opponent say yes from the beginning and keep him or her from saying no as much as possible. As soon as you say no, your ego begins to demand consistency in judgment. Once an opinion is expressed, a person feels the need to stick to it. 
That is why it is extremely important to lead the interlocutor to an affirmative answer from the very beginning. Socrates, nicknamed the Gadfly of Athens, was one of the greatest philosophers the world has ever known. He did what only a handful of people in the history of mankind have been able to do. He revolutionized the entire process of human thinking. What is his method? His pattern of conversation, now known as the Socratic method, was based on getting a series of affirmative answers from his opponent. He would ask questions that left no alternative to a yes answer, and by forcing his interlocutor to accept one assumption after another, by a chain of affirmative answers he would induce him to a conclusion that would have been vehemently opposed a few minutes earlier. The next time, we have a burning desire to tell our interlocutor that he is wrong. Let us remember old Socrates and start with a soft and gentle question, a question to which we are sure to hear the answer yes. The Chinese have a proverb that encapsulates the centuries-old wisdom. Of the East far goes the one who treads softly. From the very beginning, put your interlocutor in front of the necessity of answering you yes. Chapter 15. The safety valve that prevents resentment. Most people, in trying to sway someone to their point of view, talk too much themselves. Let your interlocutor do the talking. Because he or she knows your business and your problems better than you do. Don't be tempted to interrupt him if you disagree with him. He will not pay attention to you until he has exhausted his own ideas. This technique works equally well in business and in resolving family conflicts. Even our friends would rather tell us about their successes than listen to us brag about ours. The French philosopher La Rochefoucauld said if you seek enemies, outnumber your friends, but if you wish to have friends, let your friends outnumber you. Why does this happen? By surpassing us. Our friends feel their own importance, that the opposite situation makes at least some of them feel incomplete and envious. Give the other person a chance to speak. Chapter 16. How to get cooperation. You're much more likely to trust ideas that originate in your own head than those presented on a silver platter. Aren't you? Is it reasonable to impose your point of view on other people? Perhaps it is more rational to lead the interlocutor to the appropriate conclusions by hints. No one likes to be imposed on a product or told what to do. It is much preferable to think that we buy of our own volition and act on our own impulses. We want our wishes, our needs, our views to be taken into account. Allowing another to feel that the authorship of an idea belongs to him is useful not only in business and politics, but also in family life. Lao Tzu 25 centuries ago expressed the truths, the knowledge of which is useful for the readers of this book Rivers and Seas, being situated below the mountain streams collect the tribute of their waters and reign over the swift streams. Likewise the wise man desiring to be above men, he places himself below them desiring to be in front, he becomes behind. That is why people, having him above them, do not feel his heaviness, and seeing him in front of them, do not take it as an insult. Let the other person consider that the idea in question belongs to him. Chapter 17. A formula that will work wonders for you, undoubtedly. The person you have to deal with may be completely wrong. However, he does not know it. Do not condemn him. Try to understand him. There is always a reason why the other person thinks and acts this way and not otherwise. Establish it and get the key to his actions and perhaps to his personality. Honestly try to put yourself in his shoes. Seeing things through another person's eyes can also relieve tension when you are overcome by personal problems. Dean Donham of the Harvard Business School said before an important meeting. I would rather tramp for a couple of hours on the sidewalk in front of the office of the person I need than enter his office without having a clear idea of what I am going to say to him and what he is likely, based on my knowledge of his interests and motives, to say back to me. Sincerely try to view any situation from the other person's point of view. Chapter 18. What everyone wants. Would you like to have a magic phrase at your disposal that ends arguments, destroys ill will, awakens goodwill? and encourages others to listen to you carefully. Start like this, I don't blame you one bit for having these feelings. If I were you, I would certainly feel the same way. Such a beginning will soften even the grumpiest old grouch. You have to little reason to climb on a pedestal for being who you are. And remember that the person who comes to you irritated, prejudiced, and willing to reason rationally deserves just as little condemnation for being who they are. Three out of four people, you meet eagerly and longingly crave sympathy. In his wonderful book, The Psychology of Learning, Dr. Arthur Gates says human beings crave sympathy. 
A child readily shows a bruise and happens to inflict a minor injury on himself in order to reap the fruits of everyone's sympathy. For the same purpose, adults show their wounds, tell about their misfortunes and illnesses, especially the details of surgical operations, the tendency to feel sorry for oneself for misfortunes, real or imagined, is a somewhat universal phenomenon, be sympathetic to the thoughts and desires of others. Chapter 19. An appeal that resonates with everyone. Every man has a deep respect for himself, and likes to look upon himself as a person of noble and unselfish character. For every action a person always has to motives the true one and the one that sounds beautiful. Any person is quite aware of the true reasons for his actions. However, you should not emphasize them. All of us, being romantic at heart, like to attribute to themselves elevated impulses. Therefore, trying to influence people, appeal to the noble motives. We can say that people themselves are conscientious and strive to fulfill their obligations. There are relatively few exceptions to this rule. And I am convinced that even an individual with a tendency to cheat will, in most cases, react positively when he or she feels treated as an honest, conscientious and fair person. Appeal to loftier motives, chapter 20. That's what they do in movies. That's what they do on television. So why don't you do it? Simply stating the truth is not enough. It has to be presented in a lively, interesting, dramatic way. In order to show the product in person, you have to organize entire performances. That's what they do in movies and television. And that's what you have to do if you want to attract attention. You can dramatize your ideas in business or any other area of your life. The same facts, but presented in an entertaining and effective way. Make a very different impression. Make your ideas visible. Present them spectacularly. Chapter 21. If nothing else works, try this. To get good work down, you must awaken a competitive spirit. Not base, self-serving rivalry, but the desire to achieve excellence. The gauntlet is thrown down, is an unmistakable way of influencing people who are strong in spirit. This applies to work, with earnings alone, it is extremely difficult to attract and retain qualified people. The key is having a game. Games are loved by every successful person. An opportunity for self-expression, the opportunity to excel, to stand out, to win, to desire to feel significant, challenge yourself, try to hit a nerve. Part 3 Summary The only way to gain an advantage in an argument is to avoid. Show respect for the other person's opinion. Never say that he or she is wrong. If you are wrong, admit it quickly and forcefully. Start with a friendly tone, from the very beginning. Challenge your conversation partner to answer you with a yes and swore give the other person a chance to speak. Allow the other person to consider the idea as their own. Sincerely try to see any situation from the other person's point of view. Show empathy for the thoughts and desires of others. Appeal to loftier motives. Make your ideas visible. Present them effectively. Challenge. Try to hit the nerve. Part 4. Being a leader, how to change people without offending them or causing resentment. Chapter 22, where to start if you must point out a mistake. The most unpleasant remarks are more easily accepted if our virtues are pointed out beforehand. Perhaps, having initially made a compliment, you do not even have to talk about the original purpose of the conversation. And the interlocutor himself will come to the necessary conclusions. Starting with praise, with the assessment of merits, you do the same thing that the dentist does. Starting his work with Novocaine, the tooth will still have to be drilled, but the Novocaine will relieve the pain. Start by praising and sincerely recognizing the merits of your interlocutor. Chapter 23. How to criticize without causing self-hatred. Changing one small word is often the line that separates failure from success in trying to change people without offending them or causing resistance. Many people begin their critical statements with sincere praise, followed by a but and. Of course, a critical remark. In this situation, one feels inspired until one hears the word but, which calls into question the sincerity of the praise. In this case, the praise seems to be just an introductory phrase to the reproach for failure. The problem might not exist if we replaced but with and. Now the person will accept the praise because it is not followed by an accusation of failure. But in doing so we have drawn his attention to what we would like to change. Indirectly. Indirectly drawing attention to a mistake does wonders. In dealing with sensitive people, who may be bitterly offended by any direct criticism. So, to effectively correct the actions of others. Call people's attention to their mistakes indirectly rather than directly. Chapter 24. 
talk about your own mistakes first. It is much easier to listen to an enumeration of mistakes made if the critic begins with a sincere confession of his own sins. Just a few phrases belittling yourself and praising another can turn an arrogant and insulted person into a loyal friend. Admitting your own mistakes, even if you haven't corrected them, can encourage the other person to change their behavior as well. Before criticizing another, talk about your own mistakes. Chapter 25. No one likes to be ordered around. Instead of direct orders, employees should try to give advice. Then a person is given the opportunity to do the work himself, i.e., to act independently and to learn from his own mistakes. This method makes it easier for a person to correct his mistake. This method spares the person's ego and gives him a sense of his own importance. Such a method encourages cooperation rather than protest. The resentment caused by a harsh order, even if it is perfectly fair in a given situation, can live in a person for a very long time. Questions not only make orders more palatable, they stimulate the ingenuity of the person you are addressing. People are much more receptive to an order if they have had input into the decision to enforce it. Ask questions instead of giving orders. Chapter 26. Give man an opportunity to save his face. Prestige is very important to man, but few of us ever give it a second thought. We rudely trample on the feelings of others, insisting on our own, picking out their faults, threatening, criticizing a child or an employee in the presence of strangers. We do not consider that in doing so we hurt their ego, but a few minutes of attention, two or three respectful words, a sincere understanding of the position of the interlocutor can do so much to soften the blow. Even if we are right and the other person is definitely wrong, we will only destroy their ego if we make them lose face. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry Rote have no right to say or do anything that will humiliate a person. In his own eyes, what matters is not what I think of him, but what he thinks of himself. To hurt a person's self-esteem is a crime, give the man an opportunity to save his own face. Chapter 27. How to encourage people to succeed. People should be praised for even the smallest achievement. It encourages further improvement. Psychologist Jess Lair wrote it were, like a ray of sunshine, can warm the human soul. We cannot grow and blossom without it. And despite the fact that most of us are ready to shower others with nothing but the cold wind of criticism, we try to give our baby the warm glow of a were in one way or another. The use of praise instead of criticism is at the heart of B.F. Skinner's concept of learning, F. Skinner. This great physiologist of our time showed, in his experiments with animals and humans that by reducing criticism to a minimum meant emphasizing praise, the good in a person is strengthened, while the bad atrophies due to lack of attention. Everyone likes to be praised, but when the praise is specific, then it is necessarily sincere and, unlike those words that are said simply to cheer a person up, remember, we all seek recognition and are capable of doing anything to get it. But no one wants insincerity, no one wants flattery. If you and I can inspire those we come in contact with to recognize the hidden treasures they possess, we can accomplish much more than simply changing their behavior. We can literally transform them. William James wrote compared to what we ought to be, we are in a sort of semi-dormant state. People use only a fraction of their physical and mental resources. To summarize, we can say that human beings live far beyond their capabilities. Each of us has abilities of various kinds, which usually have no use. All abilities with or under criticism and flourish under the rays of praise. Express approval of the smallest good fortune and encourage every success. Be sincere in your estimate and generous in your praise. Chapter 28. Give your dog a good name. The chairman of the board of Baldwin Locomotive Works used to sigh a private man is easier to lead. If you command his respect and show him respect yourself for any of his qualities. In short, intending to change a man in some respect, act as if that quality were already his hallmark. Shakespeare said invent a virtue for yourself if you have none, and it would be useful to assume and openly assert the presence in a person of the virtue that you would like to develop in him. Create a good reputation for him that he would strive to live up to, and he will go to great lengths just to avoid disappointing you. There is an old saying giving a dog a bad name is like shooting him, but give it a good name and see what happens. Give a person a good reputation that they will try to live up to. Chapter 29. Make the mistake seem easily correctable. Tell your child, spouse, or employee that he or she has no aptitude for a certain activity, that he or she is stupid, dumb, and does everything completely wrong in this area, and you will deprive him 
or her of almost all incentives to improve. But use the opposite method, do not skimp on encouragement. Create the impression that for your interlocutor this task is easy. Let him know that you believe in his ability to cope with it, because he has the necessary for this innate gift, and he will spend the night to do to succeed. Use encouragement more often. Make the mistake seem easily correctable. Chapter 30. Try to make people happy to do what you expect them to do. Always try to make people feel good about doing what you suggest they do. When it becomes necessary to change someone's behavior or attitude, the following rules should be kept in mind sincere. Do not promise anything that you cannot fulfill. Forget about your own benefit and think about the other person's interests. Know exactly what it is that you want from him or her. Be able to put yourself in the other person's shoes. Ask yourself what he or she really wants. Think about what reward the person will get by doing what you are offering. Match that reward with his or her desires. When stating your demand, try to convey to the person you are talking to the idea that he or she will benefit from the task. It would be naive to assume that using these approaches will get you a favorable response. However, the experience of many people shows that it is much easier to change a person's attitude to something by applying these rules than by doing without them. Try to make people feel good about what you are offering them. Part for summary, a manager's job often involves changing the behavior of the people under him or her and their attitudes towards something. The following are some useful tips. Begin by praising and genuinely recognizing the merits of the person you are talking to. Draw people's attention to their mistakes not directly but indirectly. Before criticizing another, talk about your own mistakes. Ask questions instead of giving orders, give the person an opportunity to save face. Express approval at the slightest good fortune and encourage every success. Be sincere in your estimate and generous in your praise. Create a good reputation for the person, which he will endeavor to live up to. Use encouragement more often. Make the mistake seem easily correctable. Try to make people feel good about doing what you suggest. Thank you all for listening to the end. If you liked it, don't forget to rate and subscribe to the channel. You can buy the full version of the book at the link in the description.